it's fall, and you know what that means. It's almost jack-o'-lantern time. Squeaks wants to carve a really big pumpkin this year. So he and I were looking at some photos of pumpkins to see how big they can get. You're right, Squeaks, they certainly are giant. These pumpkins are much bigger than the ones we see at farmer's markets around the fort. Ah, Squeaks wants to know why pumpkins can get so big. We've seen some big apples and other large fruit at the market, but nothing ever as big as these prize-winning pumpkins. I mean, check this one out. And they get even bigger. The biggest pumpkin in the world was grown in 2021 and weighed in at a whopping 1,226 kilograms. That's about as much as a small car. It can get that big because pumpkins grow in a way that's a little different from other kinds of plants. Plants are living things, and all living things are made of tiny parts called cells. Living things mostly grow and get bigger by making more cells. So a pumpkin that just started growing and is small has fewer cells than a large pumpkin that's been growing for a while. You're right, Squeaks. It's like building with Lego blocks. It doesn't take as many blocks to build a small building as it does to build a big one. Bigger buildings have more blocks. Bigger pumpkins have more cells. Now, pumpkins also get bigger because each cell gets bigger. Each tiny part grows larger in size. Pumpkins spend more time doing both kinds of growing than other kinds of plants, so they end up with more cells and bigger cells. That means pumpkins can grow bigger than other garden plants like cucumbers. Oh, sure, Squeaks, you could try and grow a huge pumpkin, but there are some things that you need to know before you get started that might help out. First, giant pumpkins don't just pop up overnight. It can take months for pumpkins to get as big as the prize winners. People who grow these big pumpkins need to have a lot of patience and a lot of water. That's because cells and the pumpkins made of cells are mostly water. Some of the giant pumpkins we've seen need more than 600 liters of water every day. That's enough to fill two bathtubs. Oh, you're right, Squeaks. Water is one thing that plants need to grow. Plants have a special part inside them called xylem. It has a tube-like structure and looks a bit like a water slide. Its job, or function, is to carry water to different parts of the plant. And they have another part called phloem. Its job is to carry sugar. Scientists have found that the very biggest pumpkins grow on pumpkin plants that have more xylem and phloem than other pumpkin plants. This means lots of water and sugar can move quickly through the plant and into the growing pumpkin to help it get big. So if we wanted to grow a really big pumpkin, we should definitely start with a seed that came from a really big pumpkin, since a young plant tends to grow to about the same size as its parent plant. Hmm, let's see. Besides starting with a special seed, we would need to plant the seed in good soil and give it plenty of light. When pumpkins start to form along vines, we need to pick just one to grow and take off all of the other pumpkins. Right, so only one pumpkin gets all of the water and sugar. Oh, and in addition to making sure the pumpkin has plenty of water, pumpkin growers also give them fertilizer that has nutrients to help the plant grow and stay healthy. It's a lot of work, but just look at the results. You're right, a pumpkin that big would make a lot of pumpkin pies, but the kinds of pumpkins that grow this big aren't very tasty. They would make an okay jack-o'-lantern if you don't mind having one that has a flat side. The pumpkins grow so fast and get so heavy, the side on the ground tends to get a little squashed looking. Which, if you think about it, funky looking pumpkins make the best jack-o'-lanterns. I'm ready to start drawing some faces for my jack-o'-lantern. What do you say, Squeaks? Check out all of these Halloween candies I got, Sam. Whoa. Yeah, I've got so many different kinds of chocolates and some little fruit candies that our neighbor loves. And here's my absolute favorite, 
Candy corn! What? How do they turn corn into candy? Well, they're not actually corn, Sam. Candy corn is made to look like little corn kernels, which are actually small fruits that cover an ear of corn. Humans have been eating corn for thousands of years, but for most of that time, it wasn't as tasty as it is today. The kernels were tough, and they weren't sweet. So back before candy corn existed, you probably wouldn't find stacks of corn on the cob at a backyard barbecue. Instead, Corn was dried out in the field and ground down into tiny pieces until they looked like yellow sand or powder. Then they could be used as an ingredient to make breads, cakes, and other meals. If you've ever baked anything with cornmeal or corn flour before, then you've used these ingredients too. Meanwhile, the corn kernels that weren't ground down were often fed to farm animals, like chickens. That's why when candy corn was invented in the 1880s, some candy makers or confectioners called it chicken feed. So is there actually any corn in candy corn? Hmm, I think I remember how candy corn is made, but I'm not sure if it involves actual corn. Let's take a look at the ingredients list to learn more. Hmm, the first ingredients are sugar and corn syrup. Aha, at last she tells the truth. It is just corn after all. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Corn syrup does come from corn, but if you take a look at a bottle of corn syrup, you might wonder how. Corn kernels and corn syrup look so different. First, you take the hard outside layer of corn kernels and grind them down into a fine dust called cornstarch. Cornstarch is a solid, and if you tried to eat it by itself, it wouldn't taste very sweet. But if you heat it up and add some different chemicals, you can turn it into corn syrup, a super sweet, super sticky liquid that is full of sugar. But this sugar is a bit different from the sugar you might find in your kitchen. There are lots of types of sugars. Candy corn includes two kinds, sucrose, like the sugar we have here in the Fort Kitchen, and glucose, the sugar inside corn syrup. The glucose sugar in corn syrup is very sweet, and it's used to make a lot of foods taste much sweeter. So some of the sugary sweetness of candy corn really does come from corn. Hmm, okay, so what else is it made out of? Oh, I remember. Once the sucrose sugar and corn syrup are mixed together, confectioners add an ingredient called gelatin. Gelatin helps liquids hold a solid but wiggly shape. Mm, is it kind of like a gelatin snack cup? Oh, that's right. If you look for gelatin in a store, you might find it as a powder or as thin see-through sheets. But do you know where gelatin comes from? No, I do not. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Gelatin is made from collagen, which food scientists often get from animal bones. Bones? No way. Now, it's not like you're eating ground up bones every time you pop some candy corn in your mouth. A lot of changes have to happen to turn it into gelatin. Many people eat meat from animals, and the bones can get left behind or put in the trash. Making gelatin from the bones is a way to use as much of an animal's body as possible, so there's less waste. Gelatin is a solid at room temperature, but melts into a liquid when you heat it up. That lets you mix it in with your other ingredients. And then, when the whole thing cools down, the gelatin turns back into a solid. A pretty wiggly solid. <laughs> yeah, but a solid just the same. Now, to create the special taste and feel of candy corn, food scientists have to add a few more ingredients to the warm liquid mixture of sugar, corn syrup, and gelatin. But the most important ingredient changes how the candy corn looks. To create the classic yellow, orange, and white layers, they add food dyes to different batches. After the different colors are all mixed up, they're poured into special molds, one after the other, so they can cool and harden into a solid candy that is just the right shape. And guess what? To help the candies slide out of the molds easily, the inside of the mold starts with a little dusting of cornstarch. Hmm, sounds like candy corn is pretty corny after all. I guess you're right. That's two ways that corn is used in making candy corn. 
to help the candy taste even sweeter and to keep the candy from getting stuck. After the candies come out of their molds, there's one more ingredient that confectioners have to add. It's something called confectioner's glaze or shellac. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, what is that? A glaze or shellac is something you can use to make things shiny. Once it's out of the mold, candy corn pieces get tumbled around like laundry in a clothes dryer. But instead of drying off, they're being coated in shiny shellac. And you remember how gelatin is often made from animal bones? Well, it turns out that shellac also comes from an animal. Shellac comes from bugs. Bugs? Yep. In order to protect themselves from predators, lac bugs ooze out a special waxy coating on the trees they live on, creating special rooms for themselves. This coating is very shiny, so humans have been collecting it for thousands of years, mixing it into everything from makeup to paint to, well, Food. Maybe that's the spooky part of candy corn. One of its ingredients comes from bones, and another comes from bugs. Oh boy, bug candy sounds pretty good to me. Well, I don't think it's bug candy, but I see what you mean. Some people think it's gross, some people think it's cool, and I think it's delicious. What do you think, Sam? Hmm. Even though it's not my favorite candy, it does mean that Halloween is coming, so that's pretty cool. And it taught me a bunch of new stuff, and it has bug goo in it. So I guess it's pretty amazing. It is amazing that this candy has helped us learn so much today. For that, let's send a big thank you to Candy Corn! Sam, look at all these apples. Mm, I love apples. Who are they from? They're from our friend Juniper the Worm. She says she wants us to take these apples and make a yummy treat out of them. Mm. What do you think we should make out of them, Sam? Apple cider? A warm apple pie? How about... Caramel apples. Ooh, caramel apples, yum. Caramel is really delicious, and it has that wonderful warm brown color. But if you look at all the ingredients that go into making caramel, you might wonder where that brown color comes from. It's not from food coloring. It's a special chemical reaction that happens when you cook certain kinds of food. And it's so special, it has a name, the Maillard reaction. Why don't we make caramel apples and watch the Maillard reaction happen for ourselves. Yeah, okay, but have you ever made caramel before? Well, no. To be honest, I've never made caramel before, but you know what? Cooking is kind of like science. Sometimes you have to get in and experiment to learn something. In fact, there are actual food scientists whose whole job it is to experiment with ingredients and figure out how to combine them to create delicious meals and treats. The scientist who described the Maillard reaction was named Dr. Louis Camille Maillard, and he showed that you need just three ingredients for it to happen. First, you need two different kinds of chemicals you can find in food, proteins and sugars. But what about the third ingredient? Hmm, uh, I don't know. Ooh, it's heat. Mm. Heat is a very important ingredient in a lot of chemical reactions. And sometimes it might look like it's doing a little bit of magic, like transforming ice into water or yummy bread into even yummier toast. If we just dumped a bunch of protein and sugar into a bowl and set it on the counter, nothing would happen. But if we add heat, those tiny little bits of protein and sugar can react with each other and become something new. Something golden brown and perfect for coating our apples with. And that is the Maillard reaction in action. There are lots of foods that turn brown when you cook them. Uh, is that the Maillard reaction too? Ooh, yeah, that's right. The Maillard reaction can happen in lots of different foods, from caramel to big juicy pieces of barbecued meat. All right, I'm convinced. Let's see it in action. <laughs> All right, let's make some caramel. If we're going to do a kitchen experiment just like a science experiment, we need to make sure we're doing it safely and with the right equipment. First, let's remember to get a grown-up's help with this especially the cooking part. In order for the Maillard reaction to take place, the temperature has to be above 240 degrees Fahrenheit. That could cause a burn if you touched it. Second, let's assemble all of our ingredients. First, we'll need heavy whipping cream. This is an ingredient that comes from milk and has the protein we need. Some table sugar, corn syrup, a little butter, 
and some salt and vanilla for flavor. Oh, and Juniper's apples, of course. For cooking supplies, we'll need a stove top, a saucepan, a good stirring spoon, and a pan with some parchment paper on it. It's also really useful to have a candy thermometer to help track how hot our mixture gets. Ooh, and something pokey. Ooh, good thinking, Sam. We'll need something to stick into the apples when it's time to dip. When cooking, it's important to measure out your ingredients. In our saucepan, we need to add one cup of heavy cream, one cup of sugar, one half cup of corn syrup, and one fourth teaspoon of salt. Have your grown up slowly heat the mixture over the stove and stir it gently. Once the sugar has dissolved, meaning you can't see it anymore, add the butter and keep mixing. As soon as it starts to boil, stop stirring. Why? Oh, well, remember when we made rock candy? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you keep stirring, the sugar will start to form crystals. In rock candy, that's the right direction, but in caramel, we want it smooth and creamy, not crunchy. After the mixture reaches about 248 degrees Fahrenheit, stop stirring. Whoa, look, it's happening. You're right, Sam. The proteins and sugars are reacting because of the heat. Our caramel is turning brown. Now we can add the vanilla and let the caramel start to cool. But if it cools down, won't it turn back into cream and sugar? Ooh, good question, Sam. It is true that some things we change with heat can be changed back. like. You can melt a solid ice cube into liquid water and then freeze it into solid ice again. But not everything can be changed back after we heat them up. Do you think you could turn toast back into bread? Mm, if you could, I've never seen it happen. That's right, you can't untoast toast. And the same is true for caramel. When it cools down, it stays caramel, but it does get a bit thicker. After about five to 10 minutes of letting the caramel cool, Check on it. If it looks thick enough, try dipping one of your apples into it. And if it's still too runny, let it cool for another few minutes and try again. Ooh, our caramel looks pretty good, Sam. What do you notice? Ooh, it's golden and gooey. <laughs> yes, it is. I think that means we did it right. Mm -hmm. But sometimes mistakes can happen when cooking. If we hadn't gotten the results we wanted, what would we do? Hmm, well, since cooking is like science, maybe we could do the same thing that we do when our experiments don't turn out like we expected them to. We observe what happened, try to figure out what went wrong, and try again. That's right, Sam. For example, if our mixture turned out clumpy, maybe we didn't mix our ingredients enough at the beginning. Or if we observed a bunch of little crystals inside our caramel, Maybe we kept stirring for too long after the caramel got hot. Or maybe we get distracted and let the sugar burn completely. But what do we do if it doesn't work out? We try again. Exactly. Once your caramel is ready and you've coated an apple with it, set it on the parchment paper so it can cool. When the caramel is nice and solid, your treats are ready to eat. Mmm, this looks delicious. And even better, it was fun to make. You're right. It was super fun to be a food scientist today. And I'm glad I tried making something new. If you'd like to keep experimenting with Sam and me and all of our friends, make sure to hit the subscribe button and we'll catch you next time here at the fort. See ya.